part by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries. Coming up next on Changing Your World. It is so important to recognize that godly living includes this unfailing dependence upon the grace of God. I want you to hear it over and over again. Godly living is all about this unfailing dependence upon the grace of God. The believer in Christ cannot be said to be living a truly godly life until he is brought to a place where he bows his head, he bows his heart to the grace of God. You can interact with Creflo Dollar Ministries anytime, anywhere. All of this is at your fingertips with our state-of-the-art custom-designed app. With the broadcast feature, you can access your favorite messages, sermon series, and more. Add events to your calendar, set reminders, get directions, share with friends, and even give securely through this platform. Visit creflodollarministries.org slash app or text app to 51555 today. This is your world, so let's vow to make it a better place. Let every heart that needs to know you love is here to stay. Ooh, it's time we live a new life. Ooh, let us love shine bright in you. We're saved by His grace, so we embrace your love today. Let's begin here in the book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. We're continuing in the series, How Grace Teaches Us Godliness. How Grace Teaches Us Godliness. We know that ungodliness is a total disregard of God, and basically it's uh, to be ungodly is more than just the, wicked, the wickedness that we list in, uh, in our list, but to be ungodly is a person who neglects God. They disregard God. They don't even think it's necessary to ask for God to bless a thing anymore. That is ungodly. Uh, and the Bible says the grace of God will teach us to refuse that. But godliness is the opposite. Godliness is to, to have a regard for God. But at the very base of this, the very base of a godly lifestyle, is a voluntary submission to live a life that's dependent upon God. A voluntary uh, submission to live a life totally dependent upon God. And that's something as Christians that we have to learn how to do in order to allow grace to teach us godliness. So let's look at this scripture in verse 11, Titus chapter 2. Let's just review just a little bit. Verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all man. So the grace of God that brings salvation appears to all man. So just so you can get a mental picture, Jesus is grace. The Bible says Jesus, full of grace and truth. Now, now look at this progression. Here is Jesus first, and out of Jesus comes grace, and out of grace comes truth. They're all the same, but ultimately, Grace is not a curriculum or a subject matter. Grace is a person. His name is Jesus. And grace comes as a result of Jesus, and truth comes as a result of grace. So you can't just preach anything and call it truth. So in the New Testament, when the Bible makes reference to truth, he's making reference to grace. He's making reference to, to Jesus. Jesus, the way, the truth, you see. And so we've got to start kind of identifying these terms so we can follow along with what he's trying to show us in the New Testament. He says, for the grace of God, it brings salvation, and it's been made available to every man on the planet. Everybody that's alive had the same opportunity as you and I had. They have an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of their lives, receive him as Lord, personal Savior, and to get born again. Everybody on the planet had that opportunity. Now, you hopefully have taken advantage of that opportunity and said, yes, I believe and I receive Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior. But this grace, this opportunity to be saved and you didn't deserve it, it was made available to the whole world. Now, look at verse 12. He says, now, this grace teaches us. So this is amazing. Grace, 
Jesus. Grace teaches us. Teaches who? Teaches us who, watch this, teaches us who have received him. It, te it doesn't teach those who hadn't received him. Grace was made available to them, but they didn't receive. And because they didn't receive, then grace doesn't teach them. So grace teaches us. Somebody say, grace is teaching me right now. Grace, I mean, it, it, he's accepted the responsibility to teach all of those who believe and all of those who have received him. Grace teaches us. Well, what is he going to teach us? He's going to teach us to deny. That word deny means refuse. He teaches us that, that denying ungodliness, we're going to refuse ungodliness, which means we're going to refuse this life of disregarding God. We're going to refuse this life of neglecting God. We're going to refuse to live a life without having God in that life, okay? It's going to also teach us to refuse worldly lust. It's going to teach us to get us to the point where we are not going to allow worldly lust is all about those inside cravings and desires that are valued greater than God. Those inside cravings or desires that you value greater than God. See, I can't necessarily look at you in your life and see all of the worldly lustful things that you do because some of it is in hiding. It's hiding in your heart. It's a craving that I might not be able to see. It is a desire that I might not be able to see. But we, I want to make sure you understand that if you have a desire to value something in this world greater than God, then that is worldly lust, okay? He says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, he said that we should be sober, live soberly, live righteously, and here's where we are, that he wants to teach us to live godly in this present world. And while grace, while Jesus is teaching us, notice what he said to do in verse 13. He says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So while grace is teaching us, we're looking for the return of the Lord. Now, things are getting crazy every day. And you think it's getting crazy with the shootings and all of that. That's not the end of this. It's going to get more, it, you're going to see stuff that's going to just blow your mind. You're just like, this is, this is, this is crazy. And it's going to get more crazy, okay? The only thing that's going to stop the progression of the craziness that this world is about to see, watch this, is the rapture of the church. The rapture is going to interrupt all of this stuff that's going on right now. And uh, we are, we who have believed are in the process of allowing Jesus to, to put the final touches on our lives, the finished works on our life. Amen? So I'm not just reading to you. I'm not just telling you this. You better open yourself up and get ready. The return of the Lord Jesus Christ is at hand. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ will rise first, and those of you who are alive and remain shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and you shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and there shall you forever be with the Lord. He says, you start looking for that because that's about to happen. Systems are going to fail, and they're not going to recover like they used to recover. They're not going to rebound like they used to rebound. There are certain lies that are told, and then all of a sudden one day you're going to realize you'd been lied to. You better let the Holy Ghost teach you how to live a godly life. Are you listening to me now? All right, so let's define godliness once again. Godliness, it means to have regard for God, and it includes voluntary dependence upon Him. Godliness is all about voluntary dependence upon Him. A godly life is, is going to, for example, it's going to be free from doubt as to his wisdom, doubt as to his love, doubt as to his goodness, doubt as to his provision. You're going to depend on him, and you're going to totally trust and believe him where his wisdom is com concerned, his love, his goodness, his provision. Listen to this very carefully. Dependence upon God excludes all dependence upon self. Dependence upon God excludes all dependence upon self. So grace is trying to teach us to depend upon God and stop depending on you. Because you're going to find out some of the stuff even you depended on, you depend on, that you could be able to do this stuff, it, it's not going to be like that no more. 
all of us will be put in positions where you won't be able to fix it, but God can. And I don't want you to wait until the last minute to work on and start practicing depending on God. You need to depend on God and start depending on Him, R-A-T, right now, quick as a rat. You need to do it right now. Amen? Opportunities to depend upon God. And then every child of God should exercise unfailing dependence, if we're talking about ungodliness. Our dependence upon God should be dependent on God where His power and His love is expressed through grace. So I depend on God's power, the ability to get the job done. I depend on God's love for me. I know God loves me. I know God loves me. I know God loves me. My faith rests in the love of God. I know God loves me, therefore what He promised me will come to pass. I know God loves me, therefore I'm healed. I know God loves me, therefore I'm delivered. I know God loves me, and even if you don't get the answer right away, you still got to know God loves you and He's working something out, right? All right? Now, it is so important to recognize that godly living includes this unfailing dependence upon the grace of God. I want you to hear it over and over again. Godly living is all about this unfailing dependence upon the grace of God. The believer in Christ cannot be said to be living a truly godly life until he is brought to a place where he bows his head, he bows his heart to the grace of God. So the humble attitude here of complete dependence upon God, this attitude will express itself in voluntary submission to God's will, and you will submit yourself to this little wonderful scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 31, where it says, do all things to the glory of God. Do all things to the glory of God will become the rule for your life, as grace teaches you about godliness. It'll eventually come to the place, do all things to the glory of God. Now, here's what I'm going to show you this morning, is that when you make a decision to live a life of dependence upon God, you are giving God glory. That's how you give God glory, by depending on Him. I don't know how we've defined it in the past, but you give God glory by by, uh, exhibiting your dependence on Him. And every time you wake up and you decide to live a life dependent on God, at the same time, simultaneously, you are giving Him the glory. You say, somebody says, well, what you going to do about this? Well, I'm just relying on Jesus. You just gave God the glory. Well, what you going to do about that? Well, I'm just depending on God. You just gave God the glory. God's trying to show you that He doesn't need you to change somebody's life. He can do that on His, on his own. We, sometimes I think we think God's more dependent on us than we should on Him. Amen? And so this, this becomes pretty vital in, in, in what, we're, what we're trying to do. So the world's religions, for example, let me give an illustration on, on how thick I think this is today. The world's religions, they all have moral codes. You, pick a religion. They all have a moral code. They have some moral rules and standards that they expect you to live by. But even if you conform to it, it would not be called godly living because you decided to conform to some godly ways of living. Why? Because godly living is dependent on God. Your conformity to a rule doesn't make it godly. You may conform to something that looks godly, but to conform to something that even looks godly, but it doesn't depend on God, depend on God, it's not godly. Even if you, let's take, for example, the golden rule or uh, the Mosaic law, and, you know, you have conformity to the golden rule or to the Mosaic law, you know, it would be godly living only if it could be in full dependence upon God, only if you're dependent on God to help you with with the golden rule or help you with the Mosaic law, and it's done to His glory. See, we got this thing called, you know, this pious, devout, religious living. Some religious have these pious, devout living. However, self-sacrificing is not necessarily godliness. Why is it dependent on God? Self-sacrificing is not 
not necessarily godliness if it's not dependent on God. Now, let me give you an illustration for the church and, and, and our community today. Godly living is not mere service for others. Because we come to church and, and we think that's the thing we should do. And it is good. It has value temporarily. But God wants to move us out of the temporarily. He wants us to get into some eternal things. Godly living is not mere service for others. The present day social service programs, uh, being neighborly, the things that we do, uh, the goodwill of many churches that we show. Our church, for example, we are feeding people what, twice a week? I mean, that's cool, but if we're not dependent on God to do it, it's not godliness. Oh, we got people and we put them all in hotels. Oh, that's good, but if it's not done dependent on God, it's not godliness. And what the church has done is we do stuff to make us look godly, but we're not dependent on God for what we're doing. Y'all don't, y'all don't. I'm going to keep nailing it in. We, 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 we do this. You know, in, in some church, churches, you can have a bunch of hellions out there passing food out. And they're not dependent on God. It's the thing they do probably to make them feel pretty good about themselves. If not in dependence upon God, it's not for His glory. It may have temporary value. Yeah, the food we give out, it may have temporary value until the next week and the next week, and the next week. But now what happens when the church is not dependent on God to keep the food going, and the people that are coming getting the food are not dependent on God to have the food, and that whole system is shut down, and you still don't know how to depend on God? It had temporary value until we recognized that your roots were messed up and you were not dependent on God, you were dependent on the church to have it. No, 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 no. The church ain't God. The past ain't God. You got to learn how to depend on God for yourself. That's what grace wants to teach you. He wants to teach you godliness and how to depend on God. Now, I'm about to enter into something that has probably taken 41 years for me to figure out how to articulate it. And I I need you to hear it. I really thank God for this church. I thank God that you're students of grace. I thank God that you sit. You know how to sit. You know how to listen. You you know how to, you know, you know how to eat dinner. You know how to eat this food. Um, And maybe I might not get it right as far as how to articulate it today, but I I think it's time for me to attempt to, to do this. Now, there are five ways. We probably won't cover them all today, but The believer's life that should be in complete dependence upon God is taught in many different ways throughout the Scripture, and and we may not have recognized it. But there are five different subjects that are taught in the Bible that have been designed to teach the believer complete dependence. I want to look at the first one. The complete dependence upon God is taught through, here's the first one, through the teachings of faith through the teachings of faith. Faith is a teaching that is supposed to teach the believer, the believer about complete dependence upon God. Now, let me show you these three scriptures. We're just going to read them. You're probably going to interpret them as you have always in your past. And then I'm going to become an enemy to those three scriptures. But let's read them. Uh, first of all, the first scripture, Hebrews chapter 10, 38, Hebrews 11 and 6, and Romans 14, 23. Let's go to Hebrews 10, 38. I, I'm going to show you that, oh man, why it's so important to get this thing in context, because grace was supposed to be the teacher of complete dependence upon God. And I don't know if that happened. Let's see. Now the just shall live by faith. Yeah, he's supposed to be living by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Okay, so the question is, okay, so how is this supposed to teach me about complete dependence upon God? All right, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11 and 6. Setting it up now. Hebrews chapter 11 and 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. 
Well, I know God is pleased when we live a life of godliness and we're in complete dependence upon God, but how does this uh, accomplish that? For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He rewards those that diligently seek him. All right, let's go to Romans 14 and 23. Romans 14 and 23. See, it's easy for you to read this and define these scriptures based on what you have learned about faith in the past. And I'm telling you, you've got to ask yourself, even based on what you've learned in the past, how does that teach me complete dependence upon God, and how does it teach me godliness? Verse 23, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. All right, so now right now, ladies and gentlemen, it's obvious that an understanding of the word of faith is needed to bring out the full meaning of these scriptures. I, I have got to give you an understanding of the word of faith. If I don't give you an understanding of the word of faith, you will continue to look at these scriptures, and I guarantee you it's not going to be teaching you complete dependence on God. Somehow you'll come out having more dependence on what you can do. You follow me? Now. Let's go to the book of uh, Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse uh, 18 through 21. I want to read it in the King James and then in NLT because one of the clearest explanations of faith is found in Romans 4, 18 and 21. I mean, we've struggled. I, I remember when, when, when we start teaching this, it's like, okay, so what is it? For what is it? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. And, 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 and so what is it? What is it? Well, faith is um, acting out on God's Word. Well, what is it? And what is it? And I'm not saying I got a problem with any of that stuff, but the clearest definition of the word of faith is found here in these set of scriptures here. Are you ready? This is Abraham talking. And Abraham was promised, especially Sarah, I think it's Genesis 18, he says, you're going to conceive. She started laughing at him. Then it, I think God's like, are, are you laughing? No, no, I, I, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm just kind of, I'm happy. <laughs> and Abraham saying, I'm, what? I'm, I'm going to be 100 years old and, and, and have a kid? What? And then God showed up later on in Genesis and said, now I am here to fulfill what I promised. Now, I told you, uh, uh, Sarah, you're going to conceive. Now I'm here to bring it to pass. And God put something on that 100-year-old man and that 90-year-old woman. <laughs> and I tell you, there was something going on up in that tent that they ain't seen in a long time. You understand? <laughs> All right, now watch this. So Abraham gets this, and he says, who against hope, he believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be, verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, which means there are no seeds, there's no life-giving force, it ain't working, all right? When he was about 100 years old, and then he says, and he wasn't just a problem either, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Ain't no live eggs in there. What's going on? Watch this. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Watch the next verse, and here it is. And being fully persuaded that he had promised, he was fully persuaded that what he had promised, that what God had promised, Abraham says, I'm persuaded that what God has promised, that God was able to perform it. Did you see the dependence right there? Abraham said, he promised it, he's able. He's able. Have you become confused about what is and what is not ungodly? 
Creflo Dollar gets to the bottom of how God's grace guides you into a life of true godliness in his series, Godliness versus Ungodliness. Worldliness stems from a heart that desires anything but the Lord first. You got to believe that grace is able to instruct you and to teach you how to live a godly life, to refuse worldly lust. The likeness of Christ comes through inhabitation. He's in me. The secret is Jesus lives in me. The number one work of the Holy Spirit is to change you. This five message series can be yours for a love gift of just 30 US dollars for CDs or 40 US dollars for the DVD set. Call the number on your screen, scan the QR code, or visit creflodollarministries.org and click eStore. Order yours today. Look no further for encouragement to walk in the grace of God. The Creflo Dollar Ministries TV app provides rewarding content that is sure to nourish your mind and soul. He is the God of miracles. All it takes is a mustard seed of faith. All it takes is for you to believe and dare to stand and dare to trust God. Treat yourself to enriching messages from Pastor Dollar on grace and walking in the likeness of Christ. God has already given you his son and told you he'll give you everything else. He don't need you to try to exchange something to try to get something. All he wants is your complete dependence on him. Respond to me and show me that you depend on me. Download the Creflo Dollar Ministries TV app on your Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, and streaming devices today to stream messages of hope, grace, and understanding when you need them most. By the grace of God, we feed and clothe people, provide houses, visit hospitals and prisons, and do so, so much more. Every time you make a financial donation to support us, you do these things as well. The tangible relief we provide to God's precious people is only possible because of your faithful support. Thank you for supporting us as we strive to reach a lost and dying world for the Lord Jesus Christ. If God has placed it on your heart to support the vision of this ministry to reach the world with the gospel of grace, you may call in to make your financial donations or log on to creflodollarministries.org. God bless you. Creflo and Taffy Dollar love connecting with you. And here at World Changers, we understand the importance of using technology to do just that. We're constantly working to bring the gospel of Christ to thousands of viewers and followers around the world. And we want you to get involved. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. We want to make the word of grace available throughout every voice of social media. Thank you, partners and friends. Your love and financial support makes it possible to bring this message into millions of homes all across the globe. The preceding program was brought to you in part by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries.